Okay. We're really pleased to have been joined by uh, Elizabeth May of the Green Party in Canada. Uh, Elizabeth, you're going to talk to us about ethical oil, the Northern Gateway, <laughs> Canada's progressive position at these talks, or not as the case uh, may be. No, I, I, I'm in a very unusual position as leader of the Green Party of Canada, and I'm a member of Parliament uh, in Canada representing a community in, well, a riding in British Columbia. And uh, I have to come here and say, I think I want to defend Canada, but not our government. Mm -hmm. I want to share with people who are watching that the can vast majority of the Canadian public want real climate action, that the majority of Canadians want to stay in Kyoto, want to work within Kyoto, want to be constructive. And unfortunately, uh, we're represented right now, and for, we will be till t 2015, by a conservative government that um, is firmly against progress under Kyoto and against progress under anything. You're right. I mean, we talk about tar sands crude as though it's ethical oil because it comes from Canada. I like to point out that perhaps we should also call our asbestos exports. We should be ethical, you know, well, ethical asbestos because the only theory behind ethical oil is that because it comes from Canada and Canada is a nice country, therefore our tar sands crude, which has a lot more carbon content than conventional oil, is uh, somehow ethical. So it's, it's, it's all spin and nonsense. And to defend Canada and Canadians, most of us don't agree with what our government is doing here. And so just for, for viewers who aren't familiar with the Canadian position, what, what is the Harper government doing here? Well, that's a good question. What is the Harper government even doing here? They've made a decision which was leaked, uh, but we were quite certain on the evidence that the uh, Harper government plans to legally withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol before year's end. Uh, as such, one would wonder why are we in the room at all. It's bad faith bargaining to show up here with a duplicitous decision that's already been reached to legally withdraw. So we're making the agreements around, for instance, around uh, land use change and, and forest, around LULUCF, we're, we're actually making the second phase agreements weaker even though we don't intend to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to ask about why a government that is, uh, we, we are the only country that ratified Kyoto that ha has officially repudiated our targets. Uh, Harper did that as soon as he became Prime Minister in 2006. We've said we have not only have we failed to reach Kyoto targets, that's something people can understand, but we have actually announced five years ago that we had no intention of trying to reach our Kyoto targets and indeed it started inventing new targets against different base years. So we've played an extremely destructive role at the global level uh, ever since this government took power. And what is the ideology and what's the goal of this government? What's, what's driving it in this direction? It seems to have, and I say this in all that seriousness, it, it seems to have um, a single organizing principle, mm -hmm. which is to expand as quickly as possible the production of tar sands crude. So we're now at about 1.3, 1.4 million barrels of oil a day from the Athabasca region. And the Prime Minister has stated that his goal is that we should be 6 million barrels of oil a day. Mm -hmm. So with that much production, he wants to have the pipelines that go, for instance, from northern Alberta down to the Gulf Coast of Texas, the Keystone Pipeline, which the Obama administration has now at least delayed until they can come up with a different route that doesn't bring it through uh, the sand hills of Nebraska and through the Oglala watershed. Uh, there's also a proposal called the, the Gateway Pipeline from Enbridge to take the tar sands crude due west through uh, wil you know, very sensitive wilderness areas of northern British Columbia, through the Great Bear Rainforest to Kitimat, BC, where they'll be loaded on tankers and shipped either down to the US or to China. Uh, and can, you know, British Columbia currently has a moratorium on tanker traffic on our coastline, so that's very controversial. And I, as a British Columbian member of parliament, I'm pretty confident British Columbians won't let that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Harper government position, in the absence, we have no energy policy, mm -hmm. right? We have no uh, climate policy. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing one can find that explains the position that's been taken uh, is that uh, anything that might slow down the development of the uh, expansion of the oil sands as quickly as possible is to be opposed. And I have to say also, I, I don't think Stephen, Stephen Harper's never said this publicly, but uh, I can find no evidence that he actually understands that the climate crisis is real. I can find no evidence, and I've spoken to many scientists within the government of Canada and external to the government of Canada, that he's ever had a single briefing on the science of climate change. Mm -hmm. So I, I, he said it's a very um, unfortunate situation for a country that used to have a good reputation in the world mm -hmm. uh, on issues like climate uh, and our environmental policies, our peacekeeping policies. All of these have been changed under a very ideologically driven prime minister 
who also simply at a personal level hates the Kyoto Protocol. It's mm -hmm. really simple. It's like he's allergic to it. He hates it. And that's driving policy. Mm -hmm. And can you just explain a couple of the impacts of the, of the tar sands, the oil sands on, on Canadians and potentially also their global impact? Well, one thing that never gets discussed very much is that it's had a negative economic impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Prime Minister always touts us as an energy superpower mm -hmm. and that we're that the economy of Canada is being driven by the tar sands. And it's true uh, to the extent that as you have oil exports, uh, it certainly draws uh, wealth into northern Alberta to those companies that are involved. But the impact on Canada as a whole, it goes back to uh, what happened to the Netherlands when they first discovered North Sea oil. And it's now known in the economic literature as Dutch disease. Mm -hmm. As your exports go up from, of oil, you're, you, you're actually your dollar goes up in value. So as our dollar increased in value, the exports from Canada, from our manufacturing sector, from pulp and paper and other things, we benefited. We were more competitive from the fact we had a lower dollar than the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. As our dollar reached par with the U.S. dollar, we lost hundreds of thousands of jobs in other parts of Canada, in Ontario, in manufacturing, in pulp and paper, because if you're able to sell a product to the U.S., and the value of the Canadian dollar is 80 cents US, mm -hmm. which was historically about where we leveled out. Uh, you, you had a competitive edge, mm -hmm. which um, when you have the dollar surge, and you, you, lost, you lost a lot of, we lost a lot of jobs in manufacturing, over 300,000. So yes, the economic impact of the tar sands is what the Prime Minister talks about as purely a positive thing. But there's two sides to that, and it's quite negative. It also still benefits from uh, taxpayer subsidies. Tar sands still get about one billion plus dollars a year in in concessional tax terms for an accelerated capital cost allowance. Now the impacts on our environment: you remove huge areas of boreal forest and muskeg. It removes habitat for wildlife, particularly migratory waterfowl. You see, I mean, they dig the pits to depths of 80 meters. These are enormous, mm -hmm. huge. Uh, uh, gaping holes for, and they also create enormous uh, what are called tailings ponds where basically large bodies of water that look natural from the air so ducks will land in them but they're absolutely poisonous and they're leaching into the Athabasca River. So there are a lot of issues there, air quality issues, there's uh, acid rain issues created from the tar sands where acid rain is falling further east on the adjacent province of Saskatchewan. So there are a lot of issues of environmental impact that are direct and local. Plus, of course, there's the fact that because it takes a lot of energy to get this viscous material that's inside the dirt, I mean, it's basically a sort of like a molasses material that's 10% out of the 100% that you're digging up out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So you move an enormous amount of earth to pull out the bitumen and then you have to use, they use water and warm and hand heat to get that bitumen out of the rocks and out of the dirt to then begin to treat it as a, as a bitumen crude. And we're exporting the raw crude to other countries where it gets refined to petroleum product. So it's, it's a mad scheme. It takes a lot of carbon, it takes a lot of water, it takes a lot of energy. And it's, um, it's one part of our economy, but it's certainly not the only part of our economy. And it needs to be done in balance with the rest of the health of our economy. Mm -hmm. And you're the Green Party's only MP in Canada. Yes. Uh, are, you, are you a lone voice in standing against the tar sands? How big is the movement against this? And you know, is it something that you can win? Well, I'm not a lone voice, that's for sure. Uh, the uh, official opposition in the Canadian Parliament is now the New Democratic Party. And they have come to the position of agreeing with Greens. They didn't initially, but our position is that we we should hold any future growth or development in the tar sands at least until we figure out how to reduce the amount of energy and water into each barrel of oil produced. Mm -hmm. So they also favor uh, a freeze on uh, new growth in the tar sands and figuring this out. Uh, it's not clear where the liberals stand, but they also are critical around the edges of this and, and committed around a better carbon plan, a better climate plan. So the opposition parties uh, in the House of Commons actually collectively had a bigger popular vote than the Conservatives. But because we have a system in Canada first past the post, it's possible, and in fact it just happened, that we have a majority government with a majority of members of Parliament for the Conservative Party, even though the vote for Conservatives was 39% of the total vote in Canada. So we have a majority government with a minority of public support. And what bad are, news. <laughs> and what are you going to be doing here in order to try and tackle Canada's position or, or try and defend the position of real Canadians? Yeah, there's not much I can do about Canada's position. I mean, uh, and I'm not here 
to blast Canada. I mean, frankly, our position speaks for itself. Uh, countries around the world have already recognized that Canada is unhelpful in the way, and so I don't need to add to that. I'm, I'm trying to work as much as I can the way I've always worked before I became an MP, using, you know, information in corridors, trying to, you know, connect with other, and fortunately for me, there are elected Greens here who are negotiating. There's the, the, the Minister of Environment from Finland as Green, and Minister of Environment for Belgium as Green. So we've got Green MPs also from Germany and Sweden and Austria and, and Senator from Australia. So within that Green Global Movement, working towards success in Durban, and basically, like many other country delegations, you just have to decide that the Canadian government position is so bad that they become irrelevant to the talks. Mm -hmm. And you just have to, uh, you know, say, look, our, our people are not being represented by our government. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a defense for the Canadians who really want action to at least have one Green MP here who says we're not all, we're not happy with how our government's representing us. Mm -hmm. And how do you see it playing out over the coming days? We've got uh, three days of yeah. talks left now. Have you got any insights as to, to how this might progress? Well, I think, I, you know, right now, I mean, the key thing is for those countries that are prepared to take on a second commitment period under Kyoto to become much more uh, clear, to be braver, to stop hedging. There's a sort of an after you, Alphonse thing going on, and China's exhibited more flexibility here. Uh, I hear rumors that India is becoming also more flexible. This isn't the time for planning. Playing as, as our government called for playing hardball with developing countries. I mean, the emissions that are causing climate crisis right now are the emissions in the last hundred years for which the industrialized world holds 99% of the responsibility. So let's be clear about that. Let's see industrialized countries take on their targets, take on their commitments, and move ahead without Canada. We will have a change in government and we will run to catch up someday with emissions reductions that matter. And in the meantime, don't let a recalcitrant uh, saboteur in our midst slow us down. Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs>